So we're over here on the close-up camera. I always feel strange, you know, it's like talking hands. It's kind of kind of weird, but anyway, I want to be able to show you close-up what's going on. First, let me show you my beautiful new light box. This is one of those wafer light boxes I was talking about. Let me just move the camera out a little. Well, I guess we're not going to be able to see the whole thing. This one measures 12 by 17. And there's one smaller and one bigger. So, you know, pick the middle of the road. Um, it has a really bright light. Or you can make it a little dimmer. It's up to you. Okay? So, so pretty. I do um, store it in the box because I'm afraid I'm <laughs> going to put something down on top of it and it's going to wreck it. And I don't want that to happen. So this is manufactured by a company called Daylight. They do a lot of lighting for the craft world. And uh, so this is, you know, this is my present to me. Well, to get started with this project, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the background fabric. Now, I've done enough applique to know that um, your stitching will pull your fabric in. They always tell you to um, cut your fabric bigger and then trim it down in the end to the correct size because that is what happens. It pulls in with each stitch, etc. So you always cut your fabric a little bit bigger. And I have in this case as well. But there's one more step that I do. Um, I use a product called uh, ShapeFlex. It is um, a very light woven fusible product. And to me, it gives the fabric a little more body, a little more hand. Um, it reminds me of what I use when I make a t-shirt quilt. So it, it feels really pretty on the back. It doesn't really add a lot of weight to the fabric and I can needle through it very easily. So it's not like other fusible products that um, you would use for applique, for example. So I always um, shape flex my background fabrics. So shape flex. So that's how I prepare my fabric for the applique. So I use my shape flex. I've got my fabric on the front and you know this is where you make the decision like you do with anything else. Are you going to pre-wash your fabric or aren't you? I personally do not. Um, this is going to be a wall piece. Um, I want to keep all the chemicals in it for the UV, UV for fading, uh, for stain resistance. I want to keep all that stuff in the fibers. And you know, the shape flex will stick. It's fine. So that's my choice. That's what I do. So I do have one block started. I'll show you the progress on that. So here you go. I have it sideways so it can fit on the light box. Um, but here's a little preview. So this house has little um, Christmas lights dangling. There's going to be more work done to the trees and there's some other things that go here. And a little mouse and a heart shape and so on. And so this will, um, this is, you know, the first block. And I decided to go with vibrant colors. I love the saturation of color. And that is what you get when you use wool felt. It's the colors, there's, there's more saturation of color, it's more even, there's more selection for color. And so all of those reasons make me lean towards it. So here is that block, but just so you know, here is the one the designer chose. And so it is a unique style, right? It's that country country bumpkin look, which is so cute. It's antique and adorable. I, I do like it. Um, and I'm going to kind of have this look in the other project. So this project will be more my style, more what I like. And so nice and bright and colorful. So that's the progress on my first block. <laughs> my first and only block. But I did prep the second block for the hand stitching. And so I wanted to show you how I do that. And to do it, I'm going to use block number three. Because block two is already marked. 
Let me find that little guy over here. Here it is. All right. We have that. Okay. So in this pattern, you're going to get your color, color photo of the block. You get your instructions, the color walls you need, some instructions on how to do the stitching. Um, this particular designer uses Valdani thread, but you can use whatever you choose, obviously. And so that's that page. And then you get all the applique shapes on another page so that you can trace them onto whatever you're going to use for your applique. So for example, you could trace it onto a fusible product that you're going to fuse to the back of your wool felt or wool. Or you can trace it onto your freezer paper that you're going to use to cut the shape and then stitch it onto the background. I'm going to be using the freezer paper technique. The reason I'm going to use that technique is I find that with the nap of wool and wool felt both, my fusible, um, it's pretty hard to get it to stick. And so even though I had this fusible and I fuse everything down in place, it was coming up and coming loose and it was just very frustrating. Plus, to needle through it was a little bit more difficult. So you have to find these things out on your own. So that was my um, decision to go with the freezer paper method, which I will show you how I do. So along with that cover picture and the pieces for the applique, and just give you a little, little closer look here. For example, she clusters the items together that you're going to use on the same color wool, for example, or wool felt, right? So this is the jacket and the boot detail, and she says the cream check. Okay, so we're following her picture, so even if you change the color, you can see it on the picture and decide, oh, okay, so I'm going to do it this color. But isn't that great how they're all kind of gathered together? Because sometimes with other applique patterns, you have to search that out yourself. You know, it's, it's a different story. So this is a plus in my book when it comes to that kind of applique. And the next part you get is, I call it a layout sheet. Um, but this is the piece that's the full size of the block, and this is the one that I'm going to trace my background stitching. I mean, my stitching onto my background. Sorry about that. Now, what I mean by that is I'm not going to trace where the Santa coat goes, for example. I'm going to trace the wording that says Santa's Workshop, the wording that says Ho, 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 and any of that other... Um, those other details. Now I'll point out to you that in this particular block we have our background fabric and then she also has another piece of fabric on top of it for a more layered effect. And so these items that are traced on with the light box, I'm going to have to do that on a different piece of fabric. And I could use the same background fabric, but I found this really, oh, I just love it. Listen, go to the quilt shops, just buy some fabric. You know, we have used our fabric over this past year. And these men and women in the business, they need our money. Let's go give it to them. So I've been doing my part. So you do your part. But I want to show you this really great fabric that I got for that background piece. So, of course, I wasn't prepared ahead and pulled it out, but I went and got it back. So this is a gray gingham. I don't really know how it's going to photograph. I hope you can get the full effect. This background fabric that I chose is a white with a very light gray crackle. I hope you can see that because those two together Oh, yes, please. I love it. Now, it doesn't have to be a separate color or different fabric because on my other project, I'm doing it as directed, so I'm not changing things too much. 
we use a piece of the background fabric on top of the background fabric. So, but this one, oh yes, I am going to use this checker and I really can't wait to see what it looks like. I think it's gonna be great. Okay, so I'm skipping around a lot. Sorry about that. But you know, if you know me, you have to kind of keep up. Because I, I don't always, first of all, I never rehearse these things. I just know what I want to tell you because it's just like a couple of friends sitting together having a conversation about quilting, right? I mean, that's what I want it to be about. And so I hope it is for you. Okay, let's get started with this. So I'm going to turn the light on. Okay. Now see how it shines through, obviously. That's the whole purpose of a light box. And now you could do a couple of things. I do not have um, washi tape. So washi tape is a product that is tape. It's cute tape, um, but it pulls off paper without ripping the paper. I don't have any, and I just realized this week that I need it, so I shall get some. Um, but you would just, um, Keep your pattern in place on your light box, and hopefully you have a light box that you can fit the whole piece on. Um, if not, you work in sections. That's okay. Uh, so I'm going to put my fabric on top, and I want to make sure that I have excess fabric around all the sides, kind of evenly distribute it. And then you could, I'll show you another block, you could staple these paint the page and the fabric together so I prepared the top block of this pattern which is a really long piece um, and I put staples you know because I'm going to handle it a lot and I need to make sure that as I'm tracing everything it's not shifting and moving out of place so you can do what works for you and since I don't have any of that wonderful washi tape I'm going to use a couple of pins just to show you what I would do if I didn't have any of it, which obviously, let me grab some pins here. And so you could pin right through the paper and your top fabric. And just you, you could just hold it in place. Okay. Now there's a couple of ways that you can mark your um, your piece. You could use a pencil. A lead pencil but realize you have to wash that out and sometimes it doesn't wash out yes your stitching will cover it so maybe it won't matter I personally have made mistakes before well where I will trace something and then realize oh it I shouldn't have traced it well now there's no stitching that's going to cover that and so we found these wonderful products called the friction pens right so we have these and you can trace and iron it away they do leave a residue, and I'm not going to be washing this project. Um, so it will leave a, pre a residue because although the color goes away, it leaves like a little yellowish line. Again, I'm stitching over it. It's probably not going to matter. So I'll use the friction pen. Now here's what I want to caution you with. If you own Sharpies, move them far, far away from what you're using um, to ma mark your background. They're permanent, remember? Okay. So you just take your friction pen and um, begin marking the stitching, um, the words in the stitching for, for later. Now this piece, I'm not going to mark the lettering, as I said, because this is the piece that goes over top. But the stars over here, all these little X's, I cannot proportionally space them out, and so I am actually going to mark the X's. <laughs> you say, gee, it's a little cross stitch. You can do that, can't you? No, I can't. They won't be even. And so you just go around marking everything. Another tip is you could mark your corners just so that when you put it back on the light box later, you can line your corners up. So I do that sometimes too. So you're just going to mark the parts that you're going to stitch. You're not going to mark the area that you use to put the applique in. All right, so that's that's how you get started with that. You use a light box. You put your um, placement guide down. You put your fabric on top. You use the marking utensil that you choose. 
and you mark off any of the hand stitching, if any, in your project. Okay, step one. Let's move that aside. So with block one, I did all of that stitching already. So you can see here I, I stitched all of this um, earlier, then I started to put my applique down. But in block two, that I marked so that I could at least get started on the hand stitching. Um, I'll show you. So here you go. Let me turn the light off. I think it's a little easier to see. So here is all the marking that I did that I'm now going to stitch. Now as I said, the designer called for a Valdani thread. I do not have Valdani thread. I find it hard to purchase stuff like that online because I can't really see the color. And I know that I really need to see the color, so I just, I, one of these days when the shows open up and the shops, you know, you can start traveling to the shops and I'll build a collection of that thread because it does look yummy. So I'm going to be using DMC floss. And I decided that throughout all of my wording through this project, I'm going to use this really great gray. It's number 535. It's really nice when you want a really dark color but not black. I want a very heavy contrast for the lettering. And the gray also goes with the little bit of the gray in the background. And so this is a very cool project. You know, there's not a lot of warm tones. Um, and so this works really well for that. And so whenever I'm ready, I can start doing my stitching. Now I will, for example, this branch over here is going to be, so this little branch is going to be, um, you see this right here, right? So it's going to have these little leaves. It's like a, a mistletoe. And I won't do those in gray, those lines. I'll do like a tan or a olive green. Um, so the whole idea is, uh, that I'm showing this to you is you're going to change your colors, right? It's not just one color. And like on my first block, for example, you'll see I decided to use a green for this wreath around the ladybug. And then I decided to use another color for these little leaves. And of course, a red berry needs a knot. I do love French knots. And then, of course, over by the rose, I wanted green leaves. I did use a brown for the stems. And so, you know, make your choices. The red over here is really pretty too. All right. So that's a bit of that, um, the background information on that. And so I will take and get these ready and I will stitch, sit and stitch um, when I, whenever I'm not, um, like I don't have to have all the pieces ready for my applique. So I'll just prep all my backgrounds with all the stitching. Okay, so that's a wonderful thing to do. So then we're going to, I'm gonna show you how, I'm gonna go back to block one, and I'm gonna show you how I prepare my wool felt shapes. So on block one, I've already done my ladybug, I've already done my house and my trees and my ground. And I've done the stitch work here, so I need a heart and I need a mouse. So I'm going to show you how I do those. Let me turn the light box on. So I mentioned to you that I was going to be using the freezer paper technique. So freezer paper is just that. You get it at the grocery store and it's used almost like a butcher paper would be used to wrap your meats or whatever and put it in the freezer. So it has a nice paper here and it has a very thin coating of wax. And when that wax gets heated up with our iron, it'll stick to the fabric, but only temporarily. So it's not going to ruin your fabric and it is removed. So that's freezer paper. And you know, this, this curliness will make you crazy. So my tip for you is cut your paper, freezer paper to size. What I did was I looked at the page that I was going to be using to trace all my shapes. And I wanted to make sure that I would have enough space on this piece to fit all of the bits that I have to trace. And so I would just put it on here and see, okay, I needed about this 
Now this is the width of the roll and, you know, so I cut my piece big enough. And rather than dealing with that curling up all the time, after I cut it to size, I took it to my ironing board and I pressed it real quick, which made it stick to my ironing board, but only very temporarily without any residue left behind. And that made it flat. So, yay. So iron your freezer paper instead of struggling with that curl. That's your tip from me. Now, I have already done my house, my trees, my ladybug, and I mentioned a little bit earlier, I'm going to do the heart and the mouse. So I'll show you how that's done. I'll turn on my light box. And sometimes when there's print on the other side, you might be better off making a copy because you're going to see both lines showing through. But I know what I'm looking for, so I'm just looking for the heart. So I will just put, put it on this little corner over here. And so I put that here. And this is where you go ahead and get your Sharpie or your pencil and you start drawing your lines. Now the reason I use a Sharpie, when I use a pencil, I'm very heavy handed so I press hard and then I get all the pencil markings on my fingers and my white background for sure gets a mark on it. So I use the Sharpie and it seems to work for me. So of course you're going to trace on the line of the shape doesn't matter if it's wiggly because you will straighten that out when you cut it with your scissor. So if it's a little jiggly and wiggly, it just adds a little character. So there's my heart. And then I would trace my little, and I'm going to leave a little bit of space, and I'm going to trace my mouse head and body. Now my mouse and head and body are two different pieces, but they're going to be the same color wool felt. So it doesn't matter that I'm putting them close together because I will be able to just cut them out separately when I need to. So in this case, our heart, of course, is just freestanding heart, but our mouse has a head and a body. So when we put the body down and then we want to put the head on top, you can't have those two raw edges meeting. Um, there'll always be a gap. And so one will go under the other. And you can tell by the way your pattern is laid out, there's a little dashed line. And that dashed line is showing you this is the part that will be underneath the other piece. And this is the part that will show. So that's a little bit there of information there about um, how designers mark their patterns. Let me turn that off. So you can see my heart is a little wiggly. It's okay. I'm going to move my light box out of the way. I'm going to show you how I prepare my uh, wool felt and my freezer paper. So I'm done with this for now. Put it aside. And now we will prepare our wool felt. Now, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my wool felt product. So I created these little packages of fabric, the wool felt, and I call these palette packs. Why? Because it's a palette of color. And these pieces are five inches by half the width of fabric. And the width of fabric of wool felt is 36 inches. And so you'll see that there are six five inch by 16 to 18 inches because it's never really exact. So you want to, you know, put a rough idea. And so I have all of these packages, and I have them all on my website. You can see them there, all different colorways. Um, what I'll do is I'll do like a whole palette of one color of shades, uh, like I did here with the blue, or I'll do a collection. So this collection is very much for Christmas. So there's like gingerbread brown, Santa red, a beautiful blue, of course, green, white, and black. And it just, these are the colors that you need to use if you're doing some applique. And the reason I created these packages is exactly for that reason, for applique. Because although the grab and go kits are die cut, there's other things that I like doing with wool felt, and that is oh, something like the project we're doing right now. So you just need those pieces of wool felt. And you don't need to buy a lot of them. You don't need to buy yards. 
And so you get a nice little package of the wool felt there, you see, and you just iron all the wrinkles out and it's ready to use. And most of the time, this five inch wide will work for you on the applique. So, and of course, you know, I had to give them clever names like the green collections. They're all called Envy. So this one happens to be Envy number five. And then we have other ones like this one is Harvest. This one is Moody, right? Because it's blues, Moody. And so on. And then, of course, we have Sunshine. And we have Kisses. That one's called Kisses. Because, you know, I think I have every shade in lipstick that you see in this package. Because I love me my lip gloss. I just gotta have my lip gloss. Anyway, so there we go. So those are palette packs. So check that out on my website. So I, of course, <laughs> have a whole big bucket of scraps when it comes to my wool felt because I use it for all kinds of things. And so I picked out a few scraps out of my bucket that I knew I could use today for showing you how I work. And um, we're going to do the mouse and the heart. So these are the two fabrics I picked out for the mouse and the heart. And of course they're wrinkly because they were in the bucket. So I have my little hand, handy iron here. So I just press out the wrinkles like you do with cotton fabric. Press it out. You could use steam if you want. This happens to be a dry iron um, because I'll be working with my freezer paper. Freezer paper does not need a wet iron and what happens is it kind of gets the paper all wrinkly. So you don't want to use steam with that. So there's those guys and they are ready for the next step. So here's my pieces. Now when you trace them onto your freezer paper, you're just going to do a big cut around. You're not going to go on the lines. So just a big cut around the shape. And then you're going to take your shape and you're going to put it on your wool felt. And you know, it's just a little too close on the edges over here. And so I'm going to turn it this way. So I turn it and I know it's going to fit on my fabric. And then I just press through the freezer paper. It doesn't take a lot of heat. You don't have to leave it on very long. And that little bit of wax has made it cling to the fabric. And it'll cling long enough so that I can cut it and put it onto my, my project. And so for the little mouse, these are both the same color, so they're fine, left together. I'll put them over here, and there you go. All right, so you know, all the tools that you have, you have to have the right tool for the job. These are Karen K. Buckley's scissors. Now, Karen K. Buckley, she's very popular designer in the applique world. And these scissors are, first of all, they have big openings for your hands, okay? And they're a serrated blade. So there's very tiny serrated lines in the blades. And that is by design. When you are cutting applique, it's a thick, usually a thicker product. And what happens, you cut and it sort of pushes the fabric out of the scissor while it's cutting. And so the serrated edge will grip the fabric and allow the blades to cut and it gets a better a better cut for when you're you're doing your applique. So I'm going to now see my lines are so wiggly. That's okay. Now I can straighten them out. So I like to start, I'm going to cut away this excess here because I think it's easier to show you. I like to start on the straightaway uh, especially if I'm working up to a curve like this. And so I will come in and I will start to cut. And now when you're cutting, you're never going to close your scissor all the way. We're coming up to a curve. You're going to move your fabric for that curve, not your scissor. And that gives you a better curve. So here we are at the little in insert there and we're coming up around another curve so here we go we're going to 
curve. Okay, so we didn't have enough distance, so we take another bite. Curve, curve, curve. And we come around and down for our heart. And so this is a very country looking heart. But you can see when I cut it out, I was able to get all those little wiggly lines straighter. So that's a cute little heart. So I could prepare all the pieces for my block, put them on the felt, the wool felt, cut them out or not, just leave them like this. I can cut them when I'm ready to applique them down. Either way is okay. And then I can put it in, you know, a handy project bag. So I love these project bags that, I mean, I used to use Ziploc bags and I still do really, but these project bags are great. And I found them on Amazon. And they're so inexpensive and they're actually better than a Ziploc because I'm trying not to do so much with um, waste, you know. And a Ziploc bag, it's all crinkly, gets holes in it. And so I'm thinking that a reusable bag will be better. And so it has a nice little zipper and they're very reasonably priced. But I prep up all my pieces, I prep up my background, I put my pattern, it's all ready to go. Boom. I love it. So those are the little project bags. <clears throat> So we can continue on and cut out our little mouse. Now this has a lot of little, a lot of little turns. So Karen K. Buckley does have a smaller, a smaller scissor. Don't ask me where that one is, but I could use it if I had it. But um, that's okay, I'm gonna just use what I have. So I'm gonna come in and I'm going to trim away at my little mouse, I'm going to around his little ears, just turning my fabric, and I'll get that over here. He's a cute little country mouse, isn't he? Now on this little mouse, this little tiny nose down here is going to get a round black circle on top of it. So I'm not worried about, there's a little sharp, sharp point. I'm not worried about it. And so there's my little mouse head. All right, so I would continue to cut out the rest of my mouse and then I'll show you how I put it on to the background piece. And for that, I'm going to pull out the um, light box again. And so when I'm doing a project like this, I don't use that light box just one time to trace the design. I need to use it for the placement of where all the pieces go. Because, you know, they have to go into the background. Okay, so there's my, my little pieces. Not too hard, right? Okay. Let me put that stuff away. We'll get this iron. Okay, so I have my light box back up on my working surface and I have my placement page. So I'm going to put my block down and I'm going to use the previous shapes to line up my design. Plus I have my little corners traced out too, so that, that helps. And I'm going to put my heart in place. So I, to do that I just take my freezer paper off the back Okay. Now you can see there's still like a little bit of fuzz here, but these can be reused a few times because, you know, you iron them again and again, I think maybe seven or so times um, before it just runs out of stick, before it runs out of wax. So I place my shape, oops, goes this way. <laughs> I place my shape on my background. Oops, let's move that over so you can see it. <laughs> So I take my shape and I put it right on top there. Now you can fold your piece back and you see that stem, it goes right into where the heart, you know, that little inside point of the heart. So when I put it, my shape down, um, the placement is off a little. So I was probably off when I did my stitching. Well, I don't want it to be off. So I'm just going to move my heart a little bit because it makes more sense to adjust the pattern slightly so that this is in the right place. All right, so I'll put that over here. And then you have a couple of choices. You can just 
put a pin in to hold it in place. You could use a small applique pin if you needed to. Applique pins are very short, very tiny. Um, I'll show you one right here. So this is an applique pin. You see that's a tiny little pin. And you know, look at these big hands and sometimes they're just hard to grip. But the applique pin is small so that as you're stitching, it doesn't get in the way of your thread. Uh, and, and they kind of stay in. A longer pin will wiggle loose. So I use my applique pins for sure when I'm using my wool applique, not wool felt. The reason is because the wool applique doesn't do well with a glue stick. All right. So in my grab and go kits, for example, I will tell you to use a glue stick to temporarily hold your piece in place so that you can stitch. And you just use, you know, this is off a supply store. It's just a water soluble glue stick that is, um, it won't yellow over time. So it's, um, gosh, I can't remember the word, but you know. So you're going to keep your piece where it is. You can just fold it over a little and you just put a little smudge of glue, put it back, bring the other side over. Oh, I remember the word, it's archival. So it won't yellow your fabric over time or your, or the, it won't, um, it's acid free. It won't eat away over time. So there's my little heart in place. I'm going to turn the light off so you can get a better look now that it's there. All right, and so I would do the same thing with my mouse. Now what I do is I don't put, I won't put the mouse down. I'll stitch my heart first and then I'll go back. And so that's why the light box, it just stays out because I'm going to be going back and forth for my placement as I'm working. So uh, you could, if you were traveling, um, you could prep all your pieces and put them all down. It just, to me, is harder to work with. So, you know, you decide. So I'm stitching with, okay, let me back up a quick second. So I um, bought the optional thread package for my block of the month, my dancing chickens and flying pigs. And I did that because I wanted to experience this product from um, Wonderfill, and this is Ilana Wool. So this is a wool fiber, it's two ply, it's two ply twist, and it's made out of wool. So it buries right into your wool really nicely. What I have discovered by doing my other block is it doesn't have a lot of strength. And so as you're stitching and you're going through your fabric over and over again, it starts to wear at this thread. And it also untwists as you go. So it's, it's a little delicate. But it is beautiful, and I will be using it throughout my whole project. But I decided to use my DMC floss for this project. So I'm going to pick out the right pinkish red, and I'll do that from my big old box of DMC floss. Um, you know, you could put your floss on those little floss cards, but they get very wrinkled. Like as you wrap them around and you take your floss off, it's all wrinkly and crinkly. So I just, um, and I have skeins and skeins of DMC floss, right? So um, I also have bolts of it. And so what I do is off my bolts, I, count, I cut 24 inches in length and um, I put them all in this little plastic box and I sort them all by colors and if I'm traveling to Socation for example I just have to bring that bucket and I'll have all the colors that I'm going to need. And so here's my pinks and reds and I'm going to pick out the one that I think is going to look nice and I do remember having this um, a pinky red it's not red red, it's like a pinky red. And I like that one. So I'm going to pull that out, show you how I get started with my applique. Now this one happens to be a skein, so let's 
Let's just get about a 24 inch length and then we'll put, put the rest of it away. Here we go. And you could see it's all crinkly and wrinkly, but it's not um, as bad as it could be. So it's going to work just fine. All right, so I got my DMC floss. I'm going to separate. There's six strands here. So this is a six ply embroidery floss. Six ply embroidery floss. There you go. Uh, DMC is one of the floss companies on the market that has the most selection of color. So I'm learning a lot about floss and these threads as I'm going through my cross stitch journey and watching all the YouTubes that I can where they're talking about fiber. And so I'm getting my education that way. So I'm going to separate this into three strands. And so to do that, you just sort of work your way down the middle. And I have two, I'll have two pieces with three strands each. And that's what I'm going to use. And I will be using my um, chenille needle, number 28. And so I will put all three strands through my needle. There's a very large eye in the uh, chenille needle, so you'll be fine. And we'll put a knot on the end. Um, you can make whatever knot you want to make. This is an applique knot that I just messed up. Let's do, do that again. One, two wraps, and then you just pull it through to the end and you get a smaller knot. There you go. And just like any other stitching or cutting, I'm going to start on the straightaway. And I'm going to blanket stitch all the way around this heart using my DMC floss. And so I'll take a little bite my heart and I will stitch it down. There you go. So you get the idea. It's a lot of fun, right? So you're kind of coloring a cute little picture with thread and wool felt. So it's going to be so cute. So my, I will go back. My house has windows and a front door. Over here is um, a little teacup um, shape that says eggnog on it. And the heart has embroidery on top of the wool felt. Now the wool felt is very dense and I won't be able to see it through even wool. I won't be able to see the markings. And so in this pattern, the designer explains a technique that you could use with um, a melt away type of stabilizer. In other words, it's very clear and light you trace it on there and you stitch through it and then you wet it and the water melts away the stabilizer. There's a couple of problems with that as far as I'm concerned. I do not want to wet this project, although my DMC floss is color fast and my wool felt is color fast, I just don't want to wet my project. Um, and there's simple markings and after you understand her font and her style of making an S, you can pretty much just mark, mark it just um, by memory, just by looking and, and coming over here. So that I know she has three X's, right? It doesn't have to be exact. And then she has the word Xmas, which is just a cute, you know, nothing to get emotional over, but um, you know, a lot of Christians don't like that, but it's really just a folk art thing right now. Um, and then she makes her A's like this, like a little round circle and a longer line. And then she makes her S's are a funny little weird S looking thing. Now, my S is kind of far away from the A. What do I do? I iron it off. I iron it away. Let it cool. And then I make the... Um, the letters the way that I really want them. So I'll get my A back over there and I will get my S closer and that's ready to stitch. So after I finish my blanket stitch all around the edge, I will go back and do that embroidery on top. Well, that's how this project works. So you can see down here I did my other stitching and this um, 
stitching was I was told to do this in a back stitch. So I did this in back stitch. And since I used three strands of DMC floss, I think the back stitch looks really nice. On my other block of the month, we were also instructed to use the back stitch, you know, the one that I'm doing with all the wool. But the problem is, I'm using a single strand of thread, and the back stitch looks wiggly. So, you know, it's my project, so I'm going to do what's right and what I need to do. So I decided to do a stem stitch on that other project, and it looks just as cute, and I'm happy with it, so it's all good. In future videos of my Stitch Week, I hope to be able to show you some more progress on this project, because right now it's kind of been stagnating. It's just been sitting there, and... It's so cute that I need to have this done for the holiday season coming. I just really, really like how it looks. As I'm going along, I'm realizing, gee, how am I going to quilt this? So, you know, I have a long arm. Um, and this embroidery floss and this, over here, it's a little bit of a problem with a long arm. So I'm going to consult with my buddy. And I'm going to ask her advice on how I should um, machine quilt this piece because I am not hand quilting it. It's just not me. And um, I want to get a professional to tell me what they think. I just don't know. Since it is a wall hanging, it doesn't have to have a lot of quilting. And as busy as it is, it doesn't really need elaborate quilting on it either. So I'm going to check with her and see what makes sense. So hopefully I'll have some information to share with you the next time.